Well, welcome back to Truths from the Text. This is episode 17, and uh, we are back talking about relative names. So uh, if you skipped 16, uh, episode 16, you're probably going to want to go back, listen to that one, because uh, today we're going to do a kind of part two on this topic of uh, really a new category of naming or uh, saying things about God. And last time we talked about uh, saying that God is creator or God is Lord. And so today we're going to do a little bit review, a little bit of review on relative names and then build upon it. So Brian, I'll hand it off to you. Yeah. So again, as you mentioned, Aaron, uh, relative names are a new category that uh, involves some deeper complexity and really requires us to kind of ratchet up our philosophy game a little bit. Um, the initial points of relative names in theology are fairly straightforward and not too difficult, but fairly quickly we run into uh, a pretty hard block that requires us to engage in some speculative philosophy, some technical philosophy, uh, before then making gains in theological precision. And that's just kind of the, the nature of, of, of relative names for various reasons. We also have our eye on preparing for talking about the Holy Trinity, which rises and falls on relative names. Um, everything about the Holy Trinity uh, 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 arises from real relations of fatherhood, sonship, and so on. These are uh, real relations that Holy Scripture tells us are found in God, and we signify those real relations by relative names like father and son and so on. That is the entire engine of our Trinitarian theology, and all the rest is really just details. So we have our eye on preparing for what we need to know to apprehend that engine of thought really, really clearly when we get to Trinitarian theology. Of course, we're pressing pause right now. We're not talking at all about the Holy Trinity. We're only talking about those relations that God has as regards creatures. So rather than, for example, the eternal father and son being the uh, two parties, if you recall, the golden rule of relative names is it takes two to tango. Yeah, we're not talking about father and son or father and son and Holy Spirit. We're talking about the God world relationship. Remember, we talked mentioned last time that the English word relationship uh, is what we use to signify a relational pair two relations. We're talking about the God world relationship or God's relation to the world and the world's relation to God. Um, that's what we're talking about here. And we want to briefly review our three points from last time and then add four more to give you kind of seven basic principles of relative names, first of all, in uh, essence and attributes talk. So if you recall, we kind of handled three points last time. Uh, I just want to hit very briefly again. The first was the proper concept or definition uh, what relation is. And remember I told you that relation among all of Aristotle's accidental categories, he has 10 categories, nine accidental categories. One of them is very special and distinct from the others, defined, distinguished by its property or its proper concept or what it is. And that is being merely towards another the idea of relation that you need to have in your head, what constitutes it as itself is a certain towardsness. And this is distinct from all other accidental categories of Aristotle, all of which are not merely saying the subject who owns that. Uh, it's not merely saying it towards another, but it's actually interiorly defining, contracting, uh, and so on, the subject owner of whatever we're talking about. So if we talk about a quality, like the apple is red. Red or redness is a thing in the apple. It's an absolute accident that interiorly defines or talks about the apple itself. Whereas if I say Peter is the friend of Paul, the relative name friend 
uh, doesn't tell me anything backwardly about Peter, but merely says that he is somehow forward facing towards another, namely Paul. And that idea of forward facing is really super important and you have to get a hold of it. So the proper concept of relation doesn't backwash into the subject owner, but is only forward facing. It looks out towards another proper concept of relation. Point number one. The other thing to review is, as I've already mentioned, relations always come in pairs. Aristotle says relations are simultaneous, both in reality and in our reasoning. That doesn't mean that they're always of the same sort of realness, but what Aristotle means is whether you're looking out there in the world or you're looking in the recesses of your mind, you find one relation, you know that another one is going to be around the corner. Relations always come in pairs. This is the golden rule of relative names. It takes two to tango. Always, always, always very important. Thirdly, we talked about the fact that relations, although they are in themselves merely forward facing, that's their proper concept towards another, nonetheless, they always have some foundation whereupon they arise. And this foundation, importantly, is one of Aristotle's other absolute accidents. I shouldn't say other absolute because relative is not an absolute accident. But nonetheless, it's one of Aristotle's other accidental categories, one of the absolutes. So um, we might say, uh, my dad is the father of me. A father is a relative name, uh, forward facing my dad towards me. Yes, but it is founded upon the generative power of my dad uh, who begot me uh, and similar things of this sort. So relations have a proper concept towardsness Relations always come in pairs. And third and finally, relations always have some foundation. It's on that last point that we want to expand a little bit our fourth principle. And I just want to alert you to the fact that there are, broadly speaking, two sorts of foundations that a relation can have, and only one of which we're concerned about in theology. Aristotle teaches us that every relation among creatures is founded either upon quantity and quality or upon action, passion. And just as it is among creatures, uh, likewise, it is in theology. So we speak of relations that are founded upon quantity. These you are very familiar with relations of double and half and so on. Relations of quality are often comparison relationships where we say this color red is brighter than that color green. The idea of brighter uh, is a relative name, and it's a relation founded upon the quality redness in comparison to the quality greenness, uh, both in, let's say, two apples. So these are some examples of relations founded upon quantity and also upon quality. But we also have relations founded upon action and passion. Now, passion here uh, could be a misleading word if you just listen for the sound. Passion means reception. So when uh, I go out in the world and I am an agent of various effects and somebody else is the recipient of my work, um, that's what we're talking about. Aristotle's categories, action and passion, are correlative categories. Um, they go together, they face each other, uh, and as you're hearing, even as they talk about them, they also found relations. So when I exert myself upon another, or when I am the subject of somebody's exertion or work, upon those actions or receptions respe uh, respectively, arise a relational footprint, we might say. And that relational footprint stays there permanently, even after the action has happened in the past, or, or maybe it's an ongoing action like building a house or something like that. You might think initially of the relations that found uh, are founded upon action and passion as 
the price of doing business in the creaturely world. It is the tag or the residual footprint that identifies me as the guy who did this work here. Always, always, always that work that has come from me, now held by another recipient, uh, has its orientation to me as the original agent. And that relation endures even after I walk away uh, and live my life. So relations founded upon action and passion are uh, super, super uh, frequent uh, in creaturely reality. In fact, some philosophers will even on this uh, you know, basic point talk about the relational network of creatures or the relational webbing, everything you touch and everything that touches you, everything you do and everything that does something to you uh, establishes relational lines below the level of our sensory powers um, that wraps us all together as an ecosystem or an order, if you like. All right. There's a lot more that we can say about these among creatures, but the important point to know is that when we move into theology and we talk about relative names of God to creatures, we're never talking about relations that are founded upon quantity or quality. We're only talking about relations founded upon action and passion. This is very, very important. All relations of creatures to God, Thomas says, are founded upon or arise from the way they receive something from God. All relations of creatures to God are founded upon the way how we receive something from him. It's the causal interaction, so to speak, of God as the agent and we as the humble recipient that is the uh, uh, substructure of all the God-world relationality uh, that we want to talk about. All right, any uh, comments or thoughts there, Aaron, before we move on to a fifth point? Yeah, could you just clarify uh, the foundation not being quantity or quality in God and why it's only this uh, action passion uh, foundation um, and not the quantity quality uh, foundation? Yeah, um, well, that's a very good question. And the answer to that question is that there is no quantity or quality that God has. Quantity, broadly speaking, is a word that describes corporeal or material realities. And as you know, God does not have a body. There it is again. It's a very secret negation. It's always running. God does not have a body. And therefore, God is not greater in size or smaller in size, something along those lines, because he doesn't have fundamentally greatness in size or smallness in size. God has no size. Yeah, he's not a body. Okay. Likewise, quality, all of the simple perfections that we say of God, which are qualities or accidents with us among creatures, God is wise, God is good, other things of the sort. Um, those are qualities on our part. And for that reason, we can speak of uh, Socrates being wiser than Plato and Plato <clears throat> maybe being less wise than Aristotle, uh, things of this sort. We can make relative comparisons founded upon their qualities of wisdom because each one fundamentally has the quality wisdom to some sort of degree or another. And therefore, we can compare and contrast. In the case of God, however, he has no qualities. God is wise is a name that signifies God's essence or substance, wherein is found this perfection wisdom, although not in our way, in an accidental or shortened form, but in a mode altogether suited himself in proportion to his being. Uh, this is entering some more technical waters that maybe we'll talk about some other time. But because of this, there is no real comparison. That's the operative word, real comparison that we can engage between creatures and God. We can make a rational sort of similitude comparison of us to creatures. But in every comparison 
uh, that we comprise in our minds as we look at our wisdom and we say, well, we are wise and God is wise, but God is so much more wise than we are. And what we mean is we are so much less wise than him. What we're doing there is we are making a rational comparison. It's not a real grounds comparison out there in the world. Again, this is some technicality. Um, I was beginning to quote a, a very important quotation from Lateran Four, which was a very important council right before the birth of Thomas. In every comparison or similitude, um, there's only to be found an ever greater difference or contrast between us and God, because God so far outstrips us that although our perfections are the offscourings of his glory, nonetheless, you can't take our perfection and even come close to comparing it to him. It's a bit like talking about comparing a candle's light to the sun. It just doesn't work. Again, there's some metaphysical points here underlying this, but that's the basic idea. So why don't we have relations founded upon quantity and quality in God? Well, it's because we don't have quantity in God because God doesn't have a body and neither is there qualities in God, accidents in God, things of this sort. God is himself in his own substance and therefore no relations arise thereupon, only upon action and passion. Yeah, I think uh, uh, if you think about, remember we said this is episode 17. And so if you were just jumping in to uh, relative names and you hear, uh, you know, we hear you say God has no qualities and people are like, but I thought God is love and I thought God is good. And isn't creation just like this overflow of his goodness? It'd be very easy to forget that first we did negative names. This is where we started back in, you know, the single digit episodes before we even got to uh, some of these simple perfections and metaphorical names. And so this is in the trouble in theology is you got to like, Remember where you came from. And it's very easy because we're creatures to forget the moves you did earlier. And we're like way down the line now. So we already removed bodiness from God. Uh, if we were to do a, a deep dive into the divine simplicity, we would have removed certain metaphysical distinctions between act and potency, essence and existence, etc., and when you read uh, St. Thomas and you eventually get to relative names, it's pulling on this string, having already removed certain things from God. So uh, if some of this feels kind of weird to say God has no qualities, I thought, I thought theology is saying all the different qualities God has. You just got to remember uh, we did some negations first. Now we're in this, like we said, a whole new category of how we even talk about God. So relative names are kind of like a consequence of trying to do justice to what scripture makes us to say about God, like he created us, and yet do justice to all the other passages in the Bible that tell us things like God does not have, have a body. So remember the work we've already done when we come here so that you don't uh, you know, imagine something in your mind that's not actually true. Um, all right, let's uh, let's continue on uh, uh, wherever wherever you were in your uh, in our four points. Are we on? Are we on to point number four fifth now? Point. Fifth point. Fifth point. Here we go. All right. Here, here's another fifth point. Um, so I've told you that all relative names are somehow founded upon action, passion. Um, well, I want to give you something of a heuristic division of relative names. Again, we've sidelined Trinitarian relations. We're not talking about them. I'm talking about a division of uh, essential relations, uh, or that's bad phrasing, uh, of relations that God has to the world, a division that's important and helpful, but primarily heuristic. So it's got some grounds, but just don't run all over it uh, and you should be fine. And that's the distinction between relations that involve an absolute name, uh, a relation such as Lord, which involves the absolute name power, versus relations that involve some operation or action, uh, such as the relative name creator, which involves um, God's activity of bringing us into being uh, at, at the get-go. Okay. 
So this is a division that is helpful and important because we soon realize, um, as is often the case in scholastic theology, it's a bit more complicated than we thought it would be. And what I mean here is that there are lots of different sorts of relations in theology. We talked about last time some examples. God is the supreme good. God is the first mover, things of this sort. These all involve relative names. We talked about the fact that some names involve relations like as part of their you know, central elements, like God is eternal, things of this sort. Okay, yes, there is a lot of relational talk in theology that you have to get a hold of. But when we talk about kind of these individual, one-off, simple names, uh, straightforward names that just signify a relation, the name Lord signifies lordship, the name creator signifies creatorhood. Okay, when we talk about those names, there is a difference that's a meaningful difference between some of them, which are like Lord, that involves something found in God. You might call this an attribute of God, God's power, although you should know by now, uh, and if you don't, okay, we can review. These are the simple perfections that we've affirmed of God properly and formally way back when. Power is one of them. We haven't really talked about power very much. But founded upon power, which is something real in God, arises this relation, Lord, or Lordship, and we signify that with the relative name, Lord, in relation to creatures, versus the relative name, Creator, which signifies creatorhood, the relation creatorhood, which is founded upon God's transitive activity of bringing us into being. By transitive here, I mean that which passes over beyond the divine borderlands into our side of the equation. Okay, so when God brings us to be, when God says Genesis 1-1, uh, you know, let the heavens and earth come forth, and so on and so forth, uh, founded upon that, rather than something real in God like power, this is something real on our side, our reception and correspondently God's action is founded the relative name creator. Now, you might be listening very carefully. And you might notice that here I've just seemed to kind of contradict what I said above, namely all relative names in Dedeo Uno or uh, Essence and Attributes are founded upon action and passion. And here I am saying that relative name Lord is founded upon God's power, something real in God, and that is not an action. What am I doing? What, what am, I, am I speaking out of both sides of my mouth? Well, every relative name is somehow founded upon action and passion, somehow founded. Either immediately like creator, or more extendedly, like Lord. you got to put your thinking cap on here for a minute. But because, as you know, relative names, golden rule, it always takes two to tango. Therefore, back before creatures arose, when God had power all by his lonesome, so to speak, although God had power, he was not Lord way back before there were creatures because there was nothing for him to be Lord of. And therefore, it's only after creatures come to be whereupon God's power in relation to them has conceptually added on top of it this relation Lord, Lordship, um, that we say God is Lord. Okay. And that means that Extended off in the distance is this foundation, action, passion, even if more proximate, uh, the name Lord is founded upon God's real power in himself. And so God is Lord means, Thomas says, his power to coerce his subjects. Well, you have to have subjects. And in order for God to have subjects, he has to create them. And that creation 
the action passion uh, you know, interchange here going on is what distantly founds this relation Lord. Okay. So uh, an important distinction because Lord and creator pattern differently and creator isn't founded upon something real in God, whereas Lord is, that's really why I'm making this division, even though you're hearing it, you know, has some complications underlying. When we say God is creator, we just mean we are subjects of him or we are, we are created by him. But when we say Lord, we mean he has the power to coerce us, to put us in jail, to do what he wills, things of this sort. Okay. So that is our fifth point. Uh, before we go on to the sixth, any follow up on this, Aaron thoughts? Um, I think that's a really, uh, tricky distinction to get a hold of. And so if you didn't get it the first time, uh, be patient. Um, I was thinking of some of the, uh, if there's some good creaturely examples to help us understand this distinction, um, sometimes it's helpful to come down from theology land to creature land before going back up again. Um, do you have any suggestions for folks as they're trying to get a, get a hold of that distinction between like a, a uh, yeah, I guess the different foundation, one being more proximate, one being um, more less awesome. so. Yeah, maybe a silly, a silly illustration that might help. Sometimes silly il illustrations help. So don't quote me too hard because I don't quite remember. But there's a song, there's a funny song where this woman is speaking to her children and she's you know telling them to do xyz and they're saying why and she just says because i'm the mom the mom the mom the mom okay my mom used to sing this to us for obvious reasons well what is being said here we're saying that she's the mom well we're saying that she has the authority the rights the capacity internal to her person to command our obedience. But that's not really what I mean when I call her my mom. So I'm using an equivocation on the word mom here. In the song, when she says, well, it's because I'm the mom, it's a relative name, yes, but it's founded upon her power, her authority, her right, her strength to uh, in, instill corporeal punishment if need be, things of this sort. But when I address her as my mom, uh, I'm signifying the relation she has because she begot me. And that's a relation that's different from her authority relation, uh, even though those are wrapped together and, and very much of a piece in our, in our human experience. Nonetheless, there's different grounds, there's different foundations, there's different fundamental causes that have given rise to those relations. When I address her as my mom, all that's required to have given rise to this relative name is just the fact that she bore me and begot me, and that's all. But when she says, you do this because I said so and because I'm the mom, now she's signifying the fact that she has power and authority and strength and so on, which is different from before. Okay, So it's same name, but signifying two relations. Maybe it's not a helpful illustration because of the equivocation, but... That's the only silly illustration I can think of offhand, but it's a similar sort of thing that's going on when we talk about uh, God's relation of creator versus his relation of Lord. So is the, the practice of our mind is when we come across a relative name, so the relation is the, is the arrow, and then we're looking at um, the, so when we say foundation, we're looking at the place from which the arrow proceeds and we're trying to study uh what what is the kind of essence or the the grounds upon um uh, why i'm saying this relation at at all mm -hmm. so with in the case of mom we're, we're saying the context really matters so sometimes i'm crying and and or you know the kid's crying and the mom comes and hugs and uh be because uh, she's a mom, she's showing love and, and mercy. And then in other cases, 
it's the threat of I'm bigger than you. Um, so mom is uh, the relation is, is one of uh, I, I don't know if this would be a relation of quantity, but uh, because mom <laughs> is bigger, therefore she can inflict uh, you know pain on the on the child or something for. Yeah, you you might think of it just as what establishes the arrow. Uh, just in very simple terms, what establishes the arrow? Uh, and keep in mind, those arrows remain. So um, the fact that my mom once bore me uh, means that forever and always, she has this relation to me, even though that happened way, way back when. Right? Um, so that often gets confusing because in the transiency of life, we are having many different establishments occur, many different actions. I've, I've had a lot of interchange <laughs> with my mother and there's a lot of grounds are, are, this is where the English word relationship, where it kind of thickens like a cord. Um, you know, we talk about this with all of our relationships. Well, in philosophy, each one of those is a string that has its own relational poles tying you together. And it's just the fact that there are multiple strings now between you, which each have their own individual grounds, various activities, receptivities, uh, different uh, absolute attributes and things of this sort, um, where the, the many strings between us become bundled into a cord and it thickens and it becomes a relationship. And now, you know, switch, switch the metaphor, a husband wife relationship 50 years in, well, what are we what are we pointing to ontologically, really, when we say, wow, they are so close? We're talking about the fact that they have engaged in reciprocal action and reception for so many years that their relational network and lines is is very, very thick. Yeah. Um, kind of imagine like laser laser beam or if you ever see. Uh, like plain, plain routes on, on a globe. That sort of idea is, is really helpful to uh, kind of picture relative, relative networks, uh, things of that sort. But in any one of those cases, it might be suitable to use the same relative name, even though I'm picking out a different string. Hmm. And that's what kind of gets a little confusing. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. We'll carry on. All right. The sixth point is probably the most important. The other points are foundational. Uh, they're you know, elements that are always running. But the sixth point is the very heartbeat of talking about God's relative names to us creatures. And that is the fact that relations, we might say, are cued by each other. When one relation arises, another rises to meet it. Relations are cued upon each other. This is unbelievably important. To state it very, very precisely and rather obnoxiously, but maybe write this down so you can think about it, God's relation to us arises in our mind when we first apprehend our relation to him and God as the term or, you know, where the relation points. God, we, we consider him as the term and therefore another relation arises to me. I really botched reading that. I do apologize. Let me say it again. God's relation arises in our mind when we first apprehend the creaturely relation to God God as the target of that original creaturely relation. And then thereupon, because relations always go in pairs, his relation to us. You see this kind of cueing that happens. Relations are cued by each other. They're staged. They, they spring off of one another. This is something of an extension of Aristotle's important point that relations are simultaneous. They both rise and fall simultaneous in reality and in our reasoning. It's especially that second point. When you think of Peter's relation to Paul, you simultaneously must co-think 
of Paul's relation to Peter. Okay, why is this so important? Well, it's a point that we don't often think about in the creaturely order because it doesn't always matter which side of the two has initiated or has the the first uh, grounds of the relation, so to speak, that make the relationship as a whole obtain. And for that reason, you know, relations are just coming together, coming together, coming together, and it's no big deal. Nobody even pays attention to it. However, in theology, that order of cueing becomes extremely important. And it always goes like this. First, a creature has relation to God. We understand that. And then we understand God is the target or term, the terminus of that relation. And then we co-understand God as having a relation answering the initial creaturely relation. This is backwards of how we often talk and perhaps even often think. We say God is creator and then we are creatures. God is Lord and we are subject. God is master, we are slave, things of this sort. Okay, yes, that's true. We often place God first. I think that one of the reasons why we're, we're doing so so natively is just as something of an honorific. God goes first, okay. But ontologically and conceptually, it happens the reverse. This is very important because it adverts us to the fact, and this is our, our seventh point that I'll kind of wrap in here and talk about both these together. And that's the fact that God's relative names are temporal and contingent ones. Temporal and contingent ones. Remember I said just up above, God is Lord. Well, not before creatures, not as if he lacked power. He, of course, he has power in eternity past, but he's only Lord when and after there are creatures to be lords of. All right, what is going on there? What's happening is first a creature exists, after which it has the relation of being subject to God's power, whereupon we conceive God's power as having a relation founded upon the power, lordship to us, answering to us. So these relative names are temporal and contingent for that reason. They happen after the fact of the creaturely side. Yeah, And the reason why is because God's relations cue off of our relations metaphysically. Now, the foundation in God isn't cued. Right? God has power before and behind creatures. It doesn't matter. That's something else. But the very fact of his having a relation co-arises from but after our relation to him. This is very important because it explains why God acquires new relations and also, so to speak, loses old ones. All of that happens because a change in the state of affairs with us and among creatures. God and his side of the equation, there's no change, there's no adjustment, there's no bubbling up there in God, but upon differing states of affairs where certain things come to be and then pass away on our side of the equation, our relations come and go to God. And so likewise, his relations answering ours come and go as well. Okay. So the sixth point, once again, super important. Relations are cued by each other. That's how I call it. Maybe let me think of a better word here than cued. I don't know. By which I mean God's relation arises in our mind when we first apprehend the creature relation to him. God is the target. And then God is therefore related, answering to our relation. And then seventh point, finally, uh, for this reason, God's relative names are temporal names and contingent upon 
creatures, even though God himself and all the absolute things that he has, power, so on, is not contingent or dependent upon us. Hmm. I, uh, hearing you talk about this reminds me a lot of Paul's uh, argument in Romans 1, where he's talking about uh, the creature is uh, recognizing they're a creature, that they're uh, seeing the created things, they're discerning the eternal power and Godhead, and then they're refusing to give thanks. So it's mm-hmm. like they're um, the sin of Romans of the person in Romans one is not acknowledging the re- the arrow mm-hmm. that goes to God and is pointing. They're saying, "Nope, I'm I'm rejecting that relation, and I want to have that relation to a four footed animal or a, or a mm-hmm. beast." And then God says, "Oh, I give I give them over to." They want that relation instead of this other relation. So mm-hmm. I'm going to give them over to, to their sin. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the, uh, so when you say something like God uh, loses some relation or God, um, uh, these relations are contingent upon creatures. Can you help people who hear that and then are thinking like, but I thought we said God uh, can't, you know, change or have any, uh, you know, we can't add to God because he's, you know, he's fullness of being and all that. Uh, So where is the misstep in our thinking when we even have that question when we're working down here in the relative names realm? Think maybe initially, rather than speaking of God losing rational relations, Think, first of all, of him gaining new ones. A classic verse here, I I forget the reference, but, you know, it's one of the Psalms. Variations are repeated very frequently. Lord, you have become our refuge. Um, It's a relative name. It means God now has a relation to us of being our refuge, our hiding place. He wasn't before, and now he is. This is a new relation that God has acquired. But why has he acquired it? Well, it would be very bad for you or I to think, well, God acquired it because before he was turning his face away, but now he has decided to love us and embrace us with his arms. No, we know this is not true. Uh, We speak of this often metaphorically and we mean something true, but God in himself is only smiling at us with intense love and his face is never really turned away. Although again, we mean something real and true and important by that metaphor. So God before was not, related to us as our refuge, and now he is? Well, the reason is not something to do with God. God was, we might imagine, always holding out his hands all day long. In fact, Holy Scripture says that, and we're given certain parables, like the parable of the prodigal son, to help us imagine God in this way, because it's often easy to slip up and think of God as the one who is inhibiting or prohibiting our relationship. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, and then we get in this massive guilt trip or shame trip because we have to prove ourselves to God or earn God's favor or things of this sort. No, no, no. God is only love and that's all he knows what to do. So it wasn't something to do with God, which is the explanation for why He wasn't our refuge and now is. What changed? God didn't change. God was always wanting to be our refuge, always holding out his hands as our refuge, things of the sort. But what changed? What changed is that we decided to place our rest and find our rest and find our refuge in him. We changed. Um, Our heart, our demeanor, our soul, our tendency changed. And we took refuge in God. 
and therefore acquired this relation of being sheltered to him, whereupon it's true, God was our refuge. Do you see how that relation of God to us is cued off of our relation now taking shelter, being sheltered to him? Okay, So that's what I mean by God acquiring new relations, because something changed with us and among creatures. Um, you thought maybe it was God all along who was holding you back. Well, <laughs> look in the mirror. It was the fact that you were not trusting in him. Likewise, when we speak of God losing relations, um, when we turn ourselves away from God, God is de facto no longer turned towards us. Not because he turned his face, but because we turned our back. Um, it's very little more than this that we're saying when we talk about various relations that are that are lost. Now, that's a very negative image, and you know that it's a, a relation we want to have, which we now don't have, and likewise with God. But oftentimes, um, oftentimes it's a it's a it's a positive <laughs> for us. For example, you know, God in relation to us and our sin uh, has a relation of of judge. And when we come to Christ and we do away with our sin, uh, he no longer has that sort of bearing towards us. Um, these are very technical things. There's a lot more that we would want to say beyond just this. But what changed? Well, it wasn't something in God. It was something in us. And so, creatures ebb and flow. Our relations to God come and go. And correspondently, because relations always come in pairs, the correspondent relations that God acquires uh, to us come and go. All right, one little tiny footnote. Remember, we talked about God's relations to us being rational. This gets some technical, so don't be too afraid if it's overwhelming, because... It might be. But when we say God's relations come and go, what we mean is our conceiving of God, our mental relating God comes and goes because we no longer have the sufficient creaturely conditions to ground our true thoughts. That's why I say, we first apprehend with our mind the real creaturely relation to God. And then we understand with our mind God as the target point of this relation. And then there arises in our mind God as being related in answer to this real relation. God as being related is a mental conception. It's true. It's important. And uh, outside of our mind, there are very real grounds, the real creaturely situation, the real situation up there in God, such as God's power, if we're talking about Lord, things of this sort. But what's happening is our mind's relating of God is coming and going and God verifying that. Again, this gets, this gets into some technicals, but that's, that's really the very, very, very bottom answer, uh, which which runs off of this more basic, we turn our back, turn our face sort of thing. We're the ones spinning around. God is standing still. Um, but don't picture arrows like popping out and you know, retracting into God like little things. Rather, it's us who are looking at God standing still and us spinning around and seeing in our minds different, different states of affairs, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah. So that would be some some answer to to this sort of question. Yeah, one of the uh, analogies that's helpful. Uh, I think we've talked about this before with even something like the sovereignty, free will kinds of questions, which our minds have trouble grasping because you make you make mistakes and you just think God is like a creature. If He has determined these things, yeah. therefore. 
I don't have any free agency. And so uh, when you think about this is where you go one step down on the order of being and you think of like, um, I have the ability to write a story Mm -hmm. and I now start writing. I'm, I'm, I'm taking on a new relation of author Mm. to my creatures in my characters that I'm writing on. And it's like, I can put the book down. I can go have a sandwich. I can come back to it. It's like what's happening in my little fictional story um, isn't changing my essential attributes as a, as a person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But I have acquired a new relation to my characters and they have for the, as far as they're concerned, a very real relation to me that is totally dependent, Mm -hmm. even though I have zero dependence upon my fictional stories. Right. The relationship is real. The dependence is not equal. Yes. And I think that's that what you just said is, is really helpful to keep in mind. And then the, how much greater is is God compared yeah. my relation to my fictional characters is actually pretty close compared to God's uh, relation uh, or I guess how you say God's the ever greater dis- dissimilitude between mm-hmm. God as creator and me as a creature. Um, I'm a lot closer to my fictional characters than God is to me in that order of, of being. Um, any other thoughts on this? Uh, as we're trying to get our get our minds around relations. No, you know, it's a great illustration, a great me- a metaphor, analogy to press home the point of relationship is real. Dependence is not equal, not the same on both sides. Um, the one thing, though, I think I would add is, as you know, every illustration is good for illustrating the small point. And then if you look at other parts of the illustration, you think it's illustrating other points, it becomes very, very bad. I think this is one of those is very good for illustrating exactly what you said. The issue is then we start thinking, well, God could get up and walk away and go have a, a, you know, a sandwich and lunch sort of thing. Like God could turn, go, go off and do his stuff. No, that's where the illustration is not apropos, not for the point, not according to the intention. Uh, so, and, and where the dynamic ebb and flow or the covenant idea is really, really helpful as also having negative trade-offs, but illustrating really, really helpfully the fact that the God-creature bond uh, is permanent and sealed. And it's much more like uh, a child with his mother or something like that, or uh, a, a husband with his wife, um, where there's an engagement, there's a, there's a, uh, a pull and push and, and things of this sort, uh, as helpful and important. Uh, we hang off of God's skirts and we, uh, never let go or God carries us in his arms. And in a certain mode, it's just as real on God's side as it is on our side. And in that illustration, it's not like God can put down the pen and leave his book and go off and have, you know, do whatever. No, he's always carrying us or better said, we're always being carried. So just a small, just a small footnote, because I I know people out there are going to twist the, twist the illustration, or at least that's where my, my mind is very inclined to twist illustration into a negative direction. So I have to check myself. Um, So yeah, but that's all I would say. Yeah. The other thing I was thinking about is how is ubiquitous the right word is just like relations are everywhere. You start thinking about them. And I've been even thinking back to some of our other positive names that have all like a relational aspect to them. Right. (laughs) Um, So and and for us as creatures, it's like, well, it, it matters when it has some relevance is probably the word we would use. It's like, what is its relevance Hmm. to me that God is wise or God is good? It's like, Hmm. well, does it do me any good that God has that simple perfection? And so um, 
there's a kind of, as I'm thinking back through our mixed perfections, our metaphorical names and uh, uh, even some of our negative names. Mm. Yeah. You can kind of go back and think, what is the aspect of that name where, where there's some relational piece mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to it? And it's, yeah, it's kind of hard to get away from. It's like we're, um, yeah, there's, there's arrows shooting out of us all day long. Like you said, uh, you walk into a room and you have a new relation, <laughs> you mm -hmm. move, you move, uh, a, a limb and you have a new relation of posture to, mm -hmm. to yourself. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the more you think about relations, the more you can't escape them. They're everywhere. And, uh, uh for folks who feel like we're making maybe much ado about, uh, nothing, uh, or you're having uh, trouble getting a hold of this, remember, uh, the, uh, what you said at the beginning, if we're going to get to doing the Holy Trinity, we got to practice these relations. Um, and it's going to serve us well when we eventually uh, get there. Okay. Uh, any final, final thoughts before I wrap? Let's wrap it up. All right. Well, until next time, keep on reading. <laughs>